reminder that if you have questions, you can put them on the note cards and raise them. You raise your hand and we'll collect them for later today because everything I'm hearing is raising questions for me and I'm sure it is for you too. Again, the hashtag CERM Symposium to tell everybody what it is we're doing here. And the next man to do so is Dr. Henry Klassen, who is probably very, very tired of people referring to him as a man of vision. But I can move fast out of his reach, so he can't beat me up for that. So I'm going to say it again, that Dr. Henry Klassen is a man of vision. He is a man who has spent much of his professional life figuring out how to regenerate nerves to treat and even cure, I know that's a dodgy word, cure, but to even cure diseases of the retina and the optic nerve. And that, of course, dovetails perfectly with the CERM mission, which is why you will find him at the Stem Cell Research Center at UC Irvine. The first group of patients in a retinitis pigmentosa trial is wrapping up that study, and so I'm going to get out of the way so you can hear all about it. Disclaimer here that I do have a financial stake in what I'm going to talk about. Um, so we're using retinal progenitor cells for treatment of retinitis pigmentosa. I'm going to tell you a little bit about both of those aspects and how they come together. Uh, so retinitis pigmentosa, long series of words, what is it? Um, it's a neural degenerative disease, but unlike the diseases that affect the brain and the spinal cords that you may have heard about, uh, this impacts the retina. And it's a genetic disease, it's rare, it's severe, and it's progressive. Um, so people start out, they can see, but it only gets worse from there. Now within the retina, it's even specific to the photoreceptor cells, and those are the rods and cones. Um, and if you look even more closely, the genetic problem is manifest in genes that are expressed in the rod photoreceptors specifically. So this is like a disease of rods. Now rods, if you'll recall, uh, are important for seeing under dark conditions on a moonless night, for instance. So if you lost your rods, if your rods were dysfunctional, um, that's something you could work around with the help of a flashlight. Um, but the problem is that after the rods degenerate, the cones also degenerate. So this is like a bystander effect. The cones are not expressing the mutant gene, and yet with time, they're also lost, and that leaves the person without rods or cones and I think you can do the math that without any photoreceptors, you're, you're in a heap of trouble. Um, and so that's what the patient has to live with. You know, why am I tripping over things? And the doctor says, well, um, I've got some bad news. Um, it's bad and it's going to get worse. Um, so here you see an illustration of a microscopic view of the retina. Um, the different layers of the retina are shown in the red, but the green uh, illustrates the uh, antenna-like structures that come from the rods and the cones, and these are what actually detect light in the retina. And on the left you see what a normal array is supposed to look like, and on the right you see a, a sample from a patient with retinitis pigmentosa where the photoreceptors have degenerated, and you can see it's quite scrambled up. Now, close up like that, it's hard to miss, but realize this is a photo micrograph, so if you look at the patient as a whole, they seem pretty good. So it's just this very specific lesion affecting the photoreceptors. Now, how is it that you might want to treat that? Well, um, as the title suggested, we've been concentrating on something called a retinal progenitor cell. What's that? Well, it's like a stem cell, but it's from the retina, it's from the developing retina. These are the cells that actually give rise to the retina. So the retina had to come from somewhere, and the somewhere it comes from is retinal progenitor cells. Now what makes these different from a stem cell? Well, these cells are restricted in terms of what they can do. They can make retina, but they can't make a lot of other things. So you won't be making liver or lung or kidney using these cells. But since we're aiming to treat retinal disease, 
uh, that restriction works out just fine for us. So we were able to grow these cells in the lab, um, and um, that's the basis of our treatment. Now, we could use these cells in two basic ways. Uh, so when you're talking about a stem cell treatment, or any stem cell treatment, uh, there's two basic approaches you can use. One is that you try to replace cells that are missing. In this case, we try to replace the rods and cones. And these cells do have that potential. But there's another way you could try to treat, and that is with a local trophic effect. Uh, in this case, a neurotrophic effect, where you try to rescue or reactivate cells in the target tissue. In this case, we'd be trying to rescue rods and cones that remain in the patient's retina. Now, there are pluses and minuses to both of these approaches. Obviously, if you replace the cells and they stay replaced, then you've cured the disease. So that's nice. Uh, the downside is it can be very hard to consistently get this response uh, in a way that translates to a clinical treatment. So I think it's got potential down the road, but the point is it's putting the bar awfully high in terms of starting this whole thing out. A neurotrophic response, on the other hand, could be achieved in a much simpler uh, way, and, and so that's what we decided to aim for with the idea to do something now to slow down the progression of this disease, and we can aim for cures later down the road. So here's some animal data, um, and it basically illustrates the paradigm that we're talking about, but in an animal model. As to the far left, you see uh, a, a section from an eye of a rat. At the top is the retina. And this is a, a rat who undergoes retinal degeneration, so you could think of it as an RP rat. The retina here has not degenerated yet, um, but we, in anticipation of the degeneration that we know will occur, we've transplanted some cells. And the transplant is that spherical structure right next to the retina. Notice that this is in the vitreous cavity of the eye. It's not integrated into the retina, and it doesn't have to. Because just surviving there in the vitreous gel, this graph can put out various factors that can have this neurotrophic effect on the photoreceptors without having to integrate. This means it's a lot simpler process from the standpoint of delivering this treatment than it would be if you were trying to get these same cells underneath the retina, which would involve quite a bit of surgery. Okay, so we put the cells into the eye. Uh, that's not one cell, that's a graph. They like to stick together. And they sit there in the vitreous, like this little uh, foreign body, if you will. Um, and then we wait a period of time to see what happens. Um, and here you see two examples in the central part uh, from different rats. One of them did not receive any cell treatment. That's the untreated rat. And over here is a rat uh, that had the cell treatment. And I think you can see there's some kind of difference here. And what is it you're looking at? Well, what's been done is in both of these retinas, and you're looking at these retinas on FOSS now, so you're, you're like hovering over the retina looking down, so it's a completely different view than here. Um, in red, a red marker has been used to label rhodopsin, which is the key essential molecule for, for vision in the rod photoreceptor. Then another green marker has been used to label the middle wavelength cone photoreceptor. Um, and, whoops. So in this untreated eye, you, you see an absence of signal, and that's because the photoreceptors are gone. There's nothing left to label. Uh, in contrast, over here in the treated eye, I think you can see large numbers of red and green profiles, and these are indicative of photoreceptors of the host. These are recipient photoreceptors that have been rescued by the treatment process. So the, the graph did not put those photoreceptors there, but it rescued them. Um, and this rescue is both anatomical, as seen here, but also functional. And we measured that with a behavioral response where the cell-treated retinas perform better than the control animals. And we looked at it with ERG responses and other uh, means as well. So we satisfied ourselves 
that the animals were responding to this cell treatment. So now we have this idea of how we could treat somebody and we want to go into the clinic, um, but not so fast. So this is a brief summary of what it takes to go, okay, we've got this lab bench result, how are we going to get to the bedside? Uh, there's a whole lot involved, and we'll just kind of breeze through it, but the very first point is you have to get funding, and you need a lot of it, because it's expensive to do research, but it's even more expensive to get uh, FDA approval and to do clinical trials. So crucially, we've partnered with CERM for this, and we've had a series of CERM grants, uh, early translational, continuing on to uh, disease team grant, and followed more recently by a CLIN2. Um, so that's uh, us going through the pipeline, partnered with CERM, getting funded, and support from the people of California who made this all possible. Um, in conjunction with um, getting the funding, uh, there's a startup company. At first, uh, this startup company, JSite, uh, was tasked with the job of working with the intellectual property, that's the patents related to this technology, to prepare it for uh, what comes down the road um, to, to make this a viable uh, treatment strategy. And um, in addition, JSI has matured over the years and is now raising funds to match the CERM funding to keep moving this forward. Um, as in preparation for clinical trials, we had to make cells that are appropriate for use in humans. So uh, that meant we had to, sorry, keep doing this. Um, we had to manufacture these cells in a GMP facility, uh, much like you have here at the City of Hope. Um, in fact, we used one at UC Davis. Uh, but same story, you're gonna manufacture these cells under very uh, carefully controlled circumstances with adequate documentation uh, to convince the regulatory authorities that these cells are safe to use in people. Um, we also, of course, have to go to the FDA with a, a large body of information to get their approval to move into people. So that includes not only the animal studies I showed you, not only the documentation around the manufacturing of cells, but also very extensive safety data in animals showing that these cells uh, don't create problems in the animal recipients over long periods of time. We also had to have a clinical protocol that we were uh, proposing to use in people. And so we developed a very simple uh, approach wherein the patient with RP uh, comes into the doctor's office, they get a few numbing drops in the eye, um, and then the uh, cells are injected into the vitreous cavity, just the way we did in animals. This is a, a procedure that only takes a few seconds, um, as opposed to having uh, actual surgery. So um, that was our plan. Importantly, this is an allogeneic product, and it goes into unrelated recipients, and we do not use immune suppression. So now we get to the, here's the rubber meeting the road. Um, so we have, uh, we got approval to start a trial and the trial began in um, June of 2015. And the very first patient is sitting in the front row here today. She'll be talking to us next. So uh, I know I'm looking forward to hearing uh, her, her version of how it's been going for her. Um, so this trial started necessarily with people uh, severely affected by RP, legally blind, uh, very much handicapped by this. Um, and so that's, that's the starting point. Um, we divided it into two cohorts, um, the, the very low vision people with hand motions to 2200. And then um, after that cohort was finished, we were able to move into patients who were still visually disabled but had vision up to 2063. Um, but that's still quite impaired, especially that number doesn't tell you everything because their visual field is like a looking down a straw, basically. Um, and everything went well. We uh, uh, started with two different doses. We added two more doses uh, to explore the dose ranging further. And we've completed enrollment of uh, 28 patients last summer. And so this 
trial is still in progress, but I can tell you that the safety looks good so far. This is not wood, but it'll have to do. Um, so it's gone quite smoothly. I think the simplicity of the procedure really helps us. Uh, these cells have been tested uh, every which way, so uh, that gave us a lot of confidence going in. Um, a lot of the issues that might have been anticipated have not materialized. In particular, the immune rejection that many uh, reviewers predicted uh, did not occur. So um, we feel pretty confident about that. Another potential issue is something called an epiretinal membrane. Because we deliver these uh, cells into the jelly of the eye, it's possible that they could stick to the retina. Now, if they were bad actors, they might start forming some kind of membrane and tugging on the retina, and that could be bad. Um, but that's not what's happening. So again, we feel good. Uh, as far as efficacy, I want to caution everybody that this is a single arm study. It's uncontrolled. Uh, we will be starting a phase two study shortly. Um, but in the meantime, I can say we got a lot of interesting indicators that have allowed us to structure that phase 2B study. Um, and we look forward to finishing the initial trial later this year and reporting that data again uh, towards the end of the year. Thank you.